John Stott writes that forgiveness is an indis is as indispensable to the life and health of the soul as food is for the body. Therefore, as we move from a consideration of our material needs in the fourth petition, which is give us this day our daily bread, to now a consideration of some of the spiritual needs in the fifth and also the sixth petitions, uh, we move from uh, the indispensability of food to the body to forgiveness for the soul. This week we look at the fifth petition, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. A look at the fifth petition has to begin with the impact of sin and the necessity of forgiveness. And so we begin by looking at Paul's uh, argument in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. He says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death reigned and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Here we are reminded that the debt of sin began with the first man. Paul tells us in Romans 3 that the wages of sin is death. So death, then, is the consequence of an inability to pay back the debt of rebellion against God that began with Adam. But of course, Adam did not act alone in his first sin. He represented the whole human race. And so, Paul continues, at the very end of this verse, death spread to all men because all sinned, and then we supply in Adam. But how is that so? Well, because Adam was our federal head, we share in the unpayable debt of his first sin and fall uh, from the state, uh, original state. But also, his first sin corrupted all mankind, which has come forth from him by ordinary generation. In fact, this is uh, David's point in Psalm 51.5. It says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David is not commenting here on his own peculiar origin, but rather, more generally, on the original corruption that is inherent in all of mankind. Everyone is born in the state of sin. Everyone is conceived in sin. But, of course, that original corruption doesn't remain as a, a feature uh, apart from personal sin that uh, manifests so early on in life. It's something that uh, all of humanity uh, does, that we would not only be condemnable on account of original sin, but also, also actually condemned. Of course, that is apart from Christ. This is Paul's point in Romans 3 when he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no distinction Paul says, because every man, woman, and child has sinned against God. Not only are we sinful in the original corruption, but in particular sins. All have sinned. All have fallen short of God's glory. All are drowning in an unpayable debt on account of that sin. And so the Puritan Thomas Manton summarizes it this way. The original debt we owe is obedience. And in case of default, the next debt we owe is punishment. And therefore, we are all in need of forgiveness. So that's the bad news that gives rise to the very uh, reason that we pray this particular petition. But of course, there is also good news. For in Christ, we are forgiven this unpayable debt. Now, it is important to remember that we pray for forgiveness for Christ's sake and not for our own sake. In a general way, Daniel captures this well in his prayer in Daniel chapter 9 for exiled Israel. Verses 18 and 19, extracting them out of his prayer, he says, Oh my God, incline your ear, your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Note in these two verses how Daniel uh, frames everything that God would act for his own sake. Jerusalem, he says, is the city of God. And for to lie desolate is a matter of God's honor more than it is a matter for God's people. 
because of God's covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the welfare of Israel is just as much a matter of God's covenant faithfulness and his mercy than it is something that is owed to Israel because they are called by his name. So even though Israel deserves death for its rebellion for God's own sake, Daniel prays, prays that God would forgive the sins of his people. Now we can turn to the New Testament and see how Jesus' declaration of the coming hour of his death is couched in terms of his own glorification, that is to say uh, that he dies for his own sake. We see this in John's Gospel in John 12, 23 to 24. And Jesus answered, Then the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, the context of these verses is that uh, Jesus is uttering these words at the revelation that some Greeks were were seeking to speak to Jesus. The whole world then, Jew and Greek, were now seeking after the Son of Man in a general sense. And that indicated to Jesus that the hour had come for his glorification. But as he says here in verse 24, his glorification is wrapped up in his substitutionary death. So that the benefit of his glorification is not strictly limited to his own glory. Until he dies, he remains alone. But after he dies, he draws all people to himself. The overriding point is that his death which is, of course, an implied on account of our sin, is accomplished primarily for his sake and secondarily for our sake. It is his hour of glorification, then, that benefits us, the forgiveness of our sins, our debts. So then, when we pray the fifth petition, we pray that God would freely pardon our sins, that he would pardon them for Christ's sake. Now we need to treat one more matter here. The final part of this petition, as the Shorter Catechism notes, pivots us to the fruit of our own forgiveness, which is hearts that are ready to forgive others who sin against us. And on this point here, the Catechism notes that it is by grace that we are enabled to forgive others. Indeed, it is by grace, by God's grace, that our hearts are softened that we might be able to forgive. And one particular mechanism by which our hearts are softened is a realization of how much we ourselves have been forgiven. This is the point of Jesus' parable of the unforgiving servant. Now, this parable is prefaced by an interaction between Peter and Jesus, which we see in verses 21 and 22 of Matthew chapter 18. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Now here the bottom line of the parable of the unforgiving servant is given up front. We forgive our debtors liberally and uh, beyond what we can imagine really. Then the following parable presents a servant who is so far in debt to his master that it would take several lifetimes of work for him to pay it off. That is to say that his debt is impossible to pay off. And of course, the master's recourse when he calls in the debt is to put the servant in prison until he can pay it off, which, given how much it is, he would never be able to do. So the servant is essentially consigned, uh, in principle, to death. The master, however, as Jesus' parable goes on, has mercy on the servant. He cancels his debt. Shortly thereafter, the servant finds another servant who owes him about three months' wages in comparison to the several lifetimes of wages that he owed. And this servant treats him contemptibly, throwing him in prison until he can repay the debt. Now, when the master gets wind of this, he says the following, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? The point I hope is clear. Because we have been forgiven much, we forgive others much. Therefore, this fifth petition includes with it an acknowledgement that one fruit of God's forgiveness should be our own forgiving hearts. May we then forgive much because we have been forgiven.
forgiven. Let's move on now to a couple discussion questions here. First, does Jesus' parable in Matthew 18 require us to forgive every sin against us without exception? What, if any, would be the limitations? Second, what spiritual benefit do we get from regularly praying this petition? Let's go to God in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have forgiven us much. And that uh, as uh, we come to know your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy, that you, O oh God, uh, soften our hearts to forgive those around us. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, continually bring this uh, prayer to our mind, this petition to our mind, uh, that we would be um, uh, reflections of your great uh, love and forgiveness. And we pray all these things in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.